Good afternoon, everyone. We ready to get started? I know what everyone's thinking. This is the last talk before I can get my tickets for the game tonight. I don't know which is the worst time frame to have a talk, like right before everyone's ready to rush out the room like it's a, an emergency escape, or what I had to do about a year and a half ago, presenting to a bunch of CIOs all in business attire, and it was right after a healthy Canadian lunch, which is more like the American dinner, so everyone was kind of a little bit asleep there. So anyway, uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Let me quick show of hands. How many of you in here are security professionals, information security professionals? What about infrastructure type folks? Okay, good. So the apps folks, the like two of you that are in the room, close your ears for a second. Because we're going to be talking about how scary it was for the infrastructure folks of all the great new toys that they have for the app folks and drove you to the session today because we're going to be able to do app stuff even faster and faster and faster. So how many of you were freaked out by some of the stuff that you saw, like with OpenShift.io, in terms of we're moving really, really fast, we're going to be able to validate this stuff on the fly, code push after code push after code push. Pretty exciting stuff. It's going to cause us to think about things in a little bit different way. And that's sort of the story I want to tell you this afternoon. If you think about the physical supply chain and everything that goes along that path, we think about things like, you know, I have microchips coming from somewhere on the far side of the world coming over into America to be put into phones and things like that. There's a lot of talk lately about securing the supply chain. When we think about the digital supply chain with containers where we can have layer and layer and layer of different technologies as part of that, it's very similar. And I found this interesting snippet out of securitymagazine.com from last year that was talking about the physical supply chain. I started reading, I'm like, wow, this is interesting because it sounds exactly like what we're dealing with now with this container supply chain. Until you get to the back part on the end there where it talks about carrier vetting and driver identification. You know, I know a lot of folks that have worked in the infrastructure part of the house for years are like, yeah, I wish that I could like validate my app teams before I can let them push stuff to production because of that accident that happened a few years ago. We aren't quite to that stage. And the idea is that hopefully we don't need to do that. So my name's Matt Leitzen. I'm part of our IT digital solutions delivery team within Red Hat IT. And the core mission of our team is to di deliver digital solutions to the Red Hat as a business as quickly as possible. We're responsible for our core infrastructure from our network, storage, and compute, both our on-prem and our public cloud providers, all the way up to our custom app development and our enterprise business services and data tiers in between. Ben here is my expert witness, as I will say, so as we get to the hard questions, he's going to be able to answer some of those. He's one of the team members that helped us to stand up our OpenShift environment that we're going to be talking about today. And some of the choices, quite frankly, that we made along our journey and how do we think about these things? What are the right things that we need to balance as we're moving containers into our environment? Just to give you an idea of scope and size of what Red Hat IT is like for a comparison perspective, I know when I'm sitting in the audience, I'm like, well, are they like me? Are they not like me? I like to think about Red Hat IT as kind of being in the Goldilocks zone because we aren't too small, but at the same time, we aren't too big. And this means we have to make some interesting choices about how we operate, where some organizations are just able to put a lot of money and a lot of mass behind doing things, maybe we aren't able to do. But at the same time, we don't have some of the baggage that larger organizations that I've worked for have had in terms of process and policy. It allows us to be adaptive. But it's an interesting balancing act. And especially when we look at some of the technologies that we use from a Red Hat perspective, and it's great being part of Red Hat IT because we get to look at these technologies and not only work with our product engineering teams, but also ask ourselves questions. How can we implement this within our IT environment, our enterprise IT shop to run the business and take advantage of the value of that technology as quickly as possible? And it comes down to a lot of choices, and we'll talk about what that meant for our container ecosystem in just a few minutes. But it also allows us to have the opportunity is it just the technology that we need to implement here? Or do we need to change something about the way that we need to fundamentally operate? And some of the trade-offs is part of that. So our journey to containers started out about two years ago with the Red Hat Atomic Project. Is anyone familiar with that? 
sort of early version. This was before OpenShift Container Platform was even, I think, a thought in someone's head, quite frankly. A lot of the bells and whistles that we have today really aren't there. That presented some interesting challenges. How many of you have containers deployed in your environment today? How many of you are thinking about doing it sort of on the fence? Yeah, a lot of interesting questions and things that we had to deal with as part of that. And since the product was so early, we question ourselves in terms of, well, how am I going to marry this with my existing development environments, my dev, QA, stage, prod? Do I do the same thing? Because the application that we were looking at deploying at the time, quite frankly, relied a lot on those legacy services. So do I mirror that or I do something else? What are the things that we need to do to make sure that we're actually deploying this image atomically from environment to environment? And how do we need to change our process for applying those environmental specific configurations onto that container when it's running in the specific environments. And so we went through this journey and basically came up with some fundamental forces, I call, that we realized that we had to balance. This is around security, our standards, and speed. And we realized that if we started thinking about these in a certain way, really the idea is how do we balance these in the right approach for our organization so that we can really drive the innovation out of that technology. And if you think about it, if I'm talking about security and speed, it's just, yes, I'm going to have a security architect on this application team, and I'm going to make sure I meet all our security standards. We're going to go super, super fast. Might end up making a choice where, guess what, it doesn't adhere to our technology policy. How many of you have technology policies within your organization? A few of you in there? Something to keep in mind, and of course, we've got teams that don't often want to adhere to those technology policies or we can't change the technology policy fast enough. And so we need to keep that in mind. And at the same time, if we have an eye on our technology policy and then want to move quickly, are we leaving security out of the mix so that guess what? Oh, crap, I forgot an SSL connection to this backend service. Do I need to go back and fix it? And now I've just slowed things down even further. And the whole point is being able to make these decisions so that we can balance these three things in the right way. And so what we really arrived at is three fundamental principles that really became the foundation about how we think of our container supply chain. And these are really, we want to start from a secure place. We want to make the standards applied to those containers by default. And then also, we want to have the app dev teams kind of have their cake and eat it too with being able to do things the way that they need to to drive that innovation back into the business. The idea being the less time that they're spending worry about is the standardized, how do I secure it, the more value we're going to get into the business faster. And so from this, we came up with ways that we talk about our images. And I think Ben wasn't quite on the team in these early stages, but as I have learned throughout my career, when you be careful how you name things from the beginning because they will stick for years and years and years and years. This is an example of these, but I, I think it really suits the pattern quite well. We have our base image. We'll talk about this in a minute, but this is the secure starting point from which we want to derive all our other images. From there, we have a blessed image, which is really designed to bring the standards of our operating environment, our Red Hat IT specific standards, to the image so that the application teams have that as quickly as possible. Things like our root CA certificates, for example. In the, in the augmented image, I'm now taking this blessed image and I'm applying the application specific artifacts to that image and then deploying that. So let's get into each one of these in a little more detail. Now, those of you, and it seems like most of you have worked with containers, we know that there are many different ways to get containers into the environment. Some of these really great ways, some of these like, where the hell did that come from? Uh, and that's kind of what we want to avoid because on a good day, guess what? It is a container that we know about. It is from a trusted source. The application developer is doing everything they can. They have the automated build, so it's either rebuilding a couple times per day and refreshing against that base image source or, or maybe even once a day like we're doing right now, always up to date. On a bad day, You've got a great business application, but maybe it's a technology that no one else in the environment knows how to work with. 
maybe a different version of an OS, maybe a different version of an application server, and guess what? Then a security vulnerability comes down. What are you going to do with it? Oh, and then the application person that started that off decides to go take another job because that never happens in our world of technology today. There's a talk earlier where someone's mentioned that, you know, the unemployment rate for the technology sector is extremely low. So how do we make sure that we're balancing all these things and starting off from the secure plane? L luckily for us, and you've probably heard about this, we have the Red Hat Container Catalog, which takes a lot of the guesswork for us out of the picture, is that I can go to the catalog, find the image that I want to start off with, say a RHEL 7 image. I can now get my container health index, which is going to tell me how that was refreshed using some of the insight analytics to say, okay, what security vulnerabilities are on this? And if we're using this as the starting point, and imagine a chain. This is our starting point in our supply chain for delivering this container into the production environment is that I can continually be watching this and monitoring it, chain these things together, and have automatic events flow through. And I'll get to that in just a few minutes. So now I've got a secure starting point. So what do I do with that next? When I get to move into how do I actually bless this image? And on a fundamental value, you can say, OK, just give the application teams, you know, we're only going to use the RHEL 7 image, and we're only going to get it from the Red Hat Container Catalog. And that's nice and everything. But for those of you, for example, using JBoss in your environment, how many different ways are there to configure JBoss? There's a lot of different ways. And when something goes wrong, you kind of want to know how it's set up. And when we think about things like our root certificate authorities within our enterprise environment, do I want the application teams going through the manual effort or you know, maybe being inconsistent about how they put that into their Docker files or building their image? No, if I can do that for them and set up, say, standard enterprise repositories, connection to satellite, for example, to pull down the latest versions of the libraries that I want, and then even taking a look at how do I hook into my enterprise logging? And again, there's half a dozen different ways that you can do that. I want to take the guesswork out for, of the application team's hands within our environment. And then what I do, once I bless that image and I validate that as part of my pipeline, I'm going to put that into our Red Hat IT registry. And this is going to be fundamentally the starting point for any of the application teams. They're going to look at this registry. It's going to allow me, essentially, to have some controls around my technology policy. So imagine, for example, and I think right now we've got, what, maybe between 10 and 12 different blessed images. Is that about right, Ben? Yeah, so around 20 blessed images, that versions of enterprise application server that we want in our environment, versions of HTTPD, to take the guesswork out from the application teams, for example. But now I use this as a starting point, and if I'm chaining these things together, I can actually begin to trigger things like, what is an when does an application image get rebuilt as a result of my technology policy being updated and saying we're no longer going to use this version of this particular application service? Now, the augmented image comes into the picture. And again, thinking back to one of those earlier principles that I mentioned, guess what? I, I want the application teams to do what they do best in terms of laying down these application artifacts. We have a, a pretty standardized process within our environment, the way we deploy to our virtual machines, which basically says application teams are going to create an RPM, upload the RPM to our repository, and then that will be pulled down. Great control because it allows us to have a high degree of automation. It also allows us to have, be able to roll things back quite quickly and couple that with the way that we configure our environmental specific configurations. It works quite well if you're on the infrastructure and operations side of the house. Application teams and those team members get pretty angry a lot of the time. What well, you're telling me, I got to create an RPM? What the hell is an RPM when someone comes in off the street? So, how do we take that guesswork out and say, guess what, app team, you know whether it's best just to copy a series of files out to certain directories within your application server. You know whether it's best to create a WAR file. I don't care how you do that in your Docker file. What I do care about is that you start with our blessed image that has our enterprise standards in there and that you lay your stuff down and guess what we're going to do? As one of our former presidents used to say, we're going to trust but verify. And so we have validation scripts with server spec where we take a look at that container once the application team has put that into our IT registry and said, did they mess up anything? 
Did they change any of the configurations? Did they add additional libraries that we don't want in the environment? So now we're starting to have a high degree of confidence that what we're actually deploying into the production environment, we know every step of the way what hands have touched that image and what it's going to look like at the end of the day. And then when we get to an environment like OpenShift Container Platform that augments this with additional layers of security, we're in an even better place. And I know there are some organizations that I've spoken to, uh, not my own, thankfully, who are like, well, don't, don't really care if, if everything's not 100% secure within the image because I got my firewall in front of that, I got my IDS, I got my WAF, and all this great stuff, I don't need it. But we know, again, back to the earlier quote, we want to take a defense in depth approach so that if something happens at one of those layers, we've got a high layer of security underneath us. And this is what securing the container supply chain is all about. And again, thinking to your own organizations, there are many different choices you can make. Do I have a centralized Jenkins, for example, or do I use Jenkins that's built into the OpenShift container platform? These are all choices, and one of the things that we had to take a close look at, how does this actually apply to our environment, and what are we trying to do with this? So for our Jenkins, for example, where we have all the build pipelines in order to chain these different images together, basically say, guess what, app teams, you're doing some of this stuff your own way, do it that way, but guess what, you're gonna point to where we have the blessed images. You need to get it from that registry, and before it gets deployed to production, that final deployment pipeline is gonna be on that centralized in instance. And this is one of the things, just as an example, that we're continually evaluating as the technology catches up to where we need to be from an enterprise IT perspective. Again, one of the, I think, interesting things that causes us to challenge some of our core assumptions and how we've done things in order to make them better and better over time. So just to kind of recap this chain, so if you think of, uh, we've got a Jenkins pipeline built, and we're gonna pull down that base image from our Red Hat container catalog. We're gonna make sure that it's the version that we want that we're willing to support within our environment. And then we're basically gonna bless that. We're gonna lay down our enterprise standards and say, this is the repository that you're gonna to attach to if you wanna add any additional libraries for your application. This is the version and configuration of our application server that we wanna be able to use in the environment. And here are your choices around that. Here's the steps that you need to take. We've done most of the work, but if, to hook into our centralized logging, which again, this gets us into the whole what is it, the pets versus cattle conversation, where we like to have the pets, but guess what, now we're moving into a cattle world where I need to be able to have this identical image at every step of the way. Once we've blessed that image, the application teams are pulling that down from our centralized repository, and now they're augmenting it. And they have their own commands in order to get their application-specific artifacts into that environment into that specific image and then check it in. And then again, we've told them basically that, guess what, that's the same image that's gonna get deployed to absolutely every single environment. So working with them to define things like the shared secrets for database configuration, which database are you gonna to point to and which environment with the same image getting deployed, which are the services and their URIs that are required for that and all those questions that had to be answered as part of the way. But again, making sure that single image gets deployed. And then we validate these different pieces of it at these steps so that, again, we have a high degree of confidence pushing that into any of our environments that we have that full chain of custody laid out, linking in then with our change management system so we can track the events that have happened along the way. And so what we think that we've been able to do as part of that, so I'm starting from a secure point. I'm implementing some of the basics of our enterprise security standards. Uh, and in the near future, we're also going to have our static code analysis as part of the same pipeline to validate these things from an application perspective and from a core image perspective at every step of the way. I've also applied some of the basic standards so that I don't have to have application teams worrying about these or like, oh my goodness, where do I get the root CA? Or we have a new application team member joining. We want them to get up to speed as quickly as possible. And then when you add on new and fancy tools, 
like we're showing here at Summit today, it just becomes even better, right? There's lower risk in terms of doing something that could harm our environment or harm our business. And that ultimately is what gets us the speed and the innovation that the business of today demands. So try to make that a little bit quick talk. We've got a few minutes for questions, and I know that some people are ready to get out in the environment. I've got Ben Pritchett here to answer some of the difficult ones. Uh, so why don't we start in the front of the room and kind of move our way back. I think that's what I would sign at the end result and sort of, you know, if you think, uh, and again, going back to the article I read, you know, you'll stamp the side of a shipping container that says, yes, this is the version and I know everything that's inside of it. These are talking about some of the steps. How do I put the right things inside of it to begin with? So less about tampering and how do I make sure that I'm putting the right pieces in place at every step of the way when this thing is changing? Ben, I'll give you a mic if you want to add anything to that. No, you got it. Another question over here? Yeah, so really how do we apply some of the same concepts to the source to image build? And so I'll let Ben get into some of the details because one of the things that Ben is working on with the team is that blessed image part that we were talking about. We're actually creating blessed source to image images, quite frankly, so that we can get some of the same benefits we talked about here, but also allow the application teams to take advantage of that source to image life cycle as part of the OpenShift container platform. Yeah, you want to talk um, about that? so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's one thing we're currently um, in the process of kind of finalizing right now with our application teams is, uh, and it's great that the OpenShift platform allows you to kind of hook into the S2I process when you want to do things that aren't just implementing kind of the vanilla quick starts that they provide. Um, so that's kind of what we're finalizing right now is the things that, the, the places that we need to hook into the S2I process to get our tools in place and our, our kind of sec security requirements and then again, with S2I, you can basically just kind of push it to an external registry. Um, so it, it ends up in the same final place, which is our IT registry. Um, and then you can just treat it like a regular augmented image from that point. Um, so really, you're just looking at the, the kind of uh, beginning build pieces um, that change with S2I and how we can bless that process. But the final result ends up. Um, in, in the same place. Yep, so third-party containers, that really goes back to we have chosen as our starting point for that the Red Hat container catalog. And so as that begins to evolve and we start to see ISV containers in there, for example, that may be something that we look at. Right now, I don't think we've had within our IT environment too, too many, I don't think any, quite frankly, just sort of raw containers here go and deploy that. But that would be a case working with our information security team that how have we validated that vendor and are we doing anything to modify that? So back to the question, you know, as the vendor actually signed this and asserted that it has been signed and, you know, validated from their internal controls perspective before we deploy that into our environment. So that's something that we're keeping an eye on. I don't think we, do we have, I don't think we have any examples of sort of just third party vendor images that we've had to no, deploy. I'm, that's part of the, the kind of the docker utility is you get that that hash that defines the, the container from that point um, we haven't really looked at any additional signing past that um, so we we do have the the insight as to what gets pulled into the openship platform and, and how it gets run from there uh, it's something we could look at um, we we haven't really gotten a, a request from our infosec team to really yeah, I think the way that we look at that and, and some of the choices to explain a little bit better our larger ecosystem of our, our container environment is what we're talking about here is what we refer to as our IT managed platform. And so we have a high degree of control as to who gets access to that platform and what goes into that platform to begin with. So there needs to be a change record, for example, when you're pushing containers out. So that's in effect minimizing the risk that there's gonna be a rogue container because we, we are doing the tagging on the containers as we're pushing them to our registry. We are only pulling the images from our registry. Now, as we look, we also have what we call our open 
platform environment where anyone in Red Hat has access to that and they can do things. And that's where we'd want to look at a, what are the images that we're actually running in this environment and how are we signing and things like that. So I think that's a matter of choice for your specific organization and how are you minimizing the risk across the different vectors and, and what are the right decisions to make. So I think as Ben said, we'll continue, we continue to look at that from an information security perspective and with our InfoSec team and to understand what's gonna be the best choice for us so that we get that right balance of security with speed. I think there's a little bit of that going on. I'd love to hear Ben's comments on this one as well. Most of our application teams right now, we basically said we aren't ready to enable the source to image yet because we're working on the blessed images. And what we're finding as part of our journey with container adoption is that for new application development, it's probably okay, right? You can get going, you can get everything set up the right way, I can do my builds. We have a lot of application teams that are being, that are deploying their apps to standard virtual machines that quite frankly, we need to increase their knowledge about how to use containers, how do you do CI, CD more effectively? And so it's not a matter of that we've got a bunch of people sort of lining up at the gate in order to get into this environment, which allows us to have a little bit tighter controls and say, guess what? We aren't doing source to image quite yet. Do you want yeah. to add anything um, to that? Additionally, I would say within IT, we, um, we, we try to provide as much choice as possible because developers, you know, every development team is going to want to do things differently. But um, as long as they meet our requirements and that kind of validation that we provide, um, we, the, the method in which they get that, that application built is mostly up to them. Um, so really it's about adding choices and, and when we kind of formulate a new choice with, with the development team and say, you know, we haven't tried this before, let's see how it works and let's standardize it and get it available to our other development teams. Um, it's just another thing we can add to our catalog as to offerings we have in the platform. Yeah, you want to talk about the scanners that we use sure. before we validate? Um, so we use, uh, we use a tool called ServerSpec, which is based on um, um, RSpec testing, uh, which it, it kind of allows you to validate the container as if it were kind of a server. So we run a, a set of tests you know, to make sure that um, certain, uh, a, a good example is that um, certain security checks that we get from um, our YUM repos are, are installed and we don't, we pass all our checks there. Um, so we have our, our server spec utility that we run against everything. Um, OpenSCAP is something that we're looking to add in the next few months. Um, and then uh, I think you mentioned also the kind of um, code analysis that we'll be adding in our tool set as well. Yeah, so maybe talk about the size of, of your team, Ben, in terms yeah. of creating those blessed images and how you work with InfoSec and our security sure. architecture team to um, develop that. So our, our platform as a service team, that, that kind of defines a lot of these, these best practices and security requirements. Um, it's, it's kind of grown and shrunk over the past uh, few years, but right now it's at uh, four members. So we, we do more than that, though. We also manage like auto-scaling in the platform, monitoring metrics, basically anything OpenShift related. Um, and then we, we also help to define that kind of application onboarding process into the platform. Yeah, we also kind of wear a consulting role, uh, a consulting hat when we work with our dev teams um, that come to us and say, I want OpenShift. And we say, okay, um, here, here's how you get in the platform. We kind of help to get them um, you know, meeting those standards and, and doing things the right way in OpenShift. Um, we do re rely a lot on our dev teams to help us with that process. So we have many development teams within IT and even outside IT, outside of IT at Red Hat. Um, so we work, we lean on them sometimes to help us with those standards as well. Yeah, we, we often work with uh, engineering at Red Hat to, to say, uh, that, you know, this, this would be a great pull request that, that we could uh, if we could just push to get this implemented, you know, it, it would help us meet our requirements within IT. Um, we, we work with engineering daily um, on, on getting these things into the products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I, th I think we'll take a look at that as needed. I mean, for specific, we really take a look at what's required in our environment, and quite frankly, we don't 
you know, do a, we aren't a bank, for example, and from my background, coming from federal and healthcare consulting, it's a different set of regulations that we're looking at. And so part of the idea of the blessed image, again, is to apply any of those standards as easy as possible. I mean, and we'll make choices based on the applications that are gonna be using this environment. Obviously, when it comes to PCI compliance, that's a much broader spectrum than just our, our OpenShift environment. I think there are a couple talks that talk about running OpenShift in a highly regulated environment and some of the controls that you wanna put around that and some customer, Red Hat customer examples that would be good to reference for that. Well, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Hopefully you got something out of this. I think uh, ticket is line for the baseball game is probably queuing up outside the door. So enjoy and enjoy the rest of your time here at Red Hat Summit.